They're going to open up and say, cool, be part of you and come help out. Here's some other stuff you want them to look at. Or you could look at for us. And you're now part of the community. It's that simple. You don't have to write a secret letter to a secret person somewhere that, that, that you know, where you have to have the secret handshake and all that stuff to work. But you can. No, you can, yes. You will get to that point eventually, but yeah, it doesn't have to be that way. You also don't need to be a coder. No, that's what I mean. So if you can say, well, I can translate the documentation, or by the way, I noticed your documentation is two years out of date. I, I made some changes based on the latest version. Then I love you. They may not say, we don't know where to put it yet, but we will help you figure that one out too. Or maybe give you access to the server where you can actually set up that structure yourself. Because they don't have time to do it. You're part of the community. Now, there are communities that literally just claim to be a community, but it's still just that group of people that used to meet down the bar that were to talk. They don't want to talk to anyone else. It might be time to actually go to a different group that may be doing the same kind of software that is open, like, because those guys are not there for something better. They're there because they have a social club. And good luck. If they want to have a social club, then they should have that. But you may, not, you may find it easier to get into a different community. So that's it for me. We have Andrew coming up, talking a little bit more about, or I think you said about 30 minutes, 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, short. Um, <laughs> about Sabix? Yes? I don't know if you covered this, but oh, this, I mean, I've learned a lot to think phenomenal presentation. What is the security side of open source? Like, so if everyone can see the code, can't hackers, if I know someone who's purchased or is using open source, can I go into their systems and do what I want with it, because I can read it and have access to it. Like, how do you secure against that? Sure. Uh, so I don't know how much you know about how security like encryption works. Just because I know what the protocol is, doesn't mean I know the keys. Right? So in order to do encryption, I need to have, I have these long ass, at least 248 characters long, keys on each side that are randomly generated. And they have to match. So even though I know how that key is constructed, you know, the structure of it, doesn't mean anything in order for me to actually read the message. So we have public, known, even by the NSA, encryption keys out there. There's all the programs that says, here's how you have to read text and make it scramble. But the only thing that's in there is how the code works not what data it uses to do its job. And that data is different every time you want it. Well, so also to that, there's a difference between the code that runs the program and the data behind the program itself. So um, there's a major separation in that one. Um, in the security arena, especially in the governmental security arena, um, there's a market for security vulnerabilities. Um, so in open source software, everyone can look at the code, everyone can find the vulnerabilities and so forth. Um, those vulnerabilities tend to have a shorter lifespan than vulnerabilities in commercial software. So if I were to have a commercial piece of software, uh, actually, Peter, Peter. Yeah. Um, he's the... Oh, you're new, step Yeah. You made uh, changes. Yes. Him. Um, so you'll have uh, newer... sides of the industry um, pay a premium for these vulnerabilities that are not yet published. Um, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands or you know, even more uh, money, sometimes people have had their lives at risk you know, for knowledge of some of these vulnerabilities. I knew a couple of people that were affiliated in that arena and I was just very distant periphery and it was just seen parts of with interesting people, interesting things happen. Tell us, you know, um, the open source at least. Yes, you can see the vulnerabilities. Yes, you can see how the software works. Yes, you understand the whole workflow. But that's different than the data behind the, the stuff. Um, and uh, you're also in an arms race against someone discovering it and publishing it. And in commercial software, it's a lot longer of a life cycle between discovery and publish. You know, between you know, groups looking to make money off of those vulnerabilities to groups wishing to have those vulnerabilities fixed. I know people that will find a vulnerability and they'll 
to a company that will notify everybody because they just don't want to deal with the hassle. Mm -hmm. And then those companies provide a service to customers that maybe make the software or use the software. And iOS vulnerabilities are up to a million dollars now. So my name is Andrew Nelson. Um, also work with Peter at Red Hat, um, uh, so forth. So basically talk about uh, using uh, various open source products uh, uh, to monitor your smart meter. That's actually my meter on my house from Dominion. Um, it's uh, broadcasting at a very regular rate how much electricity I'm using. Most customers probably have that on their house as well. Uh, and it's actually quite interesting. So I was using uh, Fedora on a Raspberry Pi, using RTL, RTL AMR pack software package to pull the data and then setting up into my Zavix box. Um, so I've been with Red Hat eight plus years. Um, been involved in the Zavix community for uh, longer than my time at Red Hat. I've uh, been a regular speaker at the uh, Zavix conference. Wrote a couple of libraries uh, related to it and so forth. Um, Sometimes in my, when I have time, uh, make a little sawdust in my, my uh, garage, you know, doing part-time woodworking and stuff. Uh, not really a good work, woodworker, more of a sawdust maker. <laughs> so this is what we're going to basically get to. So this is a look over eight days of power consumption in my house. Now, the interesting thing uh, about it, I don't know how much you guys know about electricity, amperage is dependent upon voltage. So that's why we use wattage instead sometimes. I like to look at things in terms of amperage just because I tend to look at power rack, you know, um, uh, a, a power distribution unit will have an amp measurement on the outside, how many amps am I pulling. So this is basically converted out to uh, 120 volts at a power factor of 0 0.85. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, and you can see that at times I'm doing 80 amps of power. I'm, you know, sitting somewhere around the 11 amps average is what my house draws. About seven of those are my computers. So um, it's quite interesting uh, just you know, watching that happen. Um, here, the spike, any idea what my, that might have been? Oven. AC. Oven's a good one. Air conditioning is a good one. Uh, it was the clothes dryer. Toaster, clothes dryer. Yeah, so that was my clothes dryer right here. Now, in here, a lot of these spikes are related to the um, HVAC, the, the fan running. Um, we tend to run our fan 24-7 uh, on low, uh, so we have constant air circulation in the house, and so you'll see it spike up, you know, when we need to actually heat or cool the house. So, this is the unit computer behind it, is the software-defined radio. So, it's basically a little USB dongle um, that has um, a specific uh, DSP chip in there that allows you to create a radio uh, just by, you know, uh, a software definition. Yes? For those taking pictures, I'm going to get the and I will put them in published them. Yep. Thank you, John. Well, that I'm using is the RTL 2832U. There's a couple of them out there, but uh, RTL uh, SDR dot com, I believe, is the website. Um, it's kind of the this, the main hub of information for a lot of this stuff. Um, there's some really wicked, amazing things. We basically, took a TV. They have the aircraft and install the very software, write some scripts because we have to take the data out of the software um, you know, that, that RTL AMR creates. We have to process it and then send it up in Zavix engineering the data and then we'll have a look at it at the end. And uh, so forth. So this page, all the information you'll need to do about installing um, and Fedora 29, absolutely fantastic. I love it. Um, it's, it's working. Uh, fantastic, a lot better than the older versions of Fedora from a couple of years ago, uh, and so forth. So, I'm I'm well into the the Rel you know mindset and management space. So a lot of the tools that I'm used to are, are there. So it's a very straightforward one for me. Um, so the the method of in, of creating it uh, on my Fedora desktop, basically uh, install the ARM image, image installer, tell it which image I've downloaded to use. Uh, which uh, hardware target, which device am I going to put it onto, where's my media card, uh, which key am I going to use to add to the root user on the machine, and then resize the file system to the size of the SD card. Do all that, we're good to go. Push, put into the Raspberry Pi. So in my case, I uh, plugged it into the network directly, so I was easy to find the DHCP. I didn't have to worry about you know uh, WPA keys or anything like that.
Next, I log in after updating the OS, of course. Uh, I install the various components I need. RTL SDR, that's the base library to run the radio and get me the information. Uh, SDR Devel, um, because the uh, AMR program requires some of those pieces. The scanner software, it's kind of you know, useful to have some debug tools if you need them. Go, because AML, uh, AMR pro program is actually written in Go. And then of course the Zabbix agent. Now we're not using the full Zabbix agent, we're only using a component called the Zabbix sender. Uh, so forth. So, and then the RTL AMR software, we download it. It's actually kind of nice that Go includes the ability to just get it, compile it, and good to go. Um, so it made it really simple. Yes? What is Zabbix? So Zabbix, in a nutshell, is a systems monitoring and, uh, and performance monitoring tool. Um, it collects various data points. It can do triggering of information, send out alerts, you know, hey, this is down. Um, but the, the biggest benefit to it is out of the box, it does a lot of aggregation um, and presentation of, of data. I can, uh, in my Zabbix system, I can point at a network switch and then I can go and say, how much bandwidth is on this switch? Oh, let's look at a 24 hour period. Let's look at an 8 hour period. Hey, what happened at 4 o'clock yesterday for 3 hours? Let me look at that window. Um, so it really allows me to dive deep. Um, many of you guys may have played with um, MRTG. Yeah, MRTG. MRTG will you know, break it into five minute, one hour, 24 hour, one month, one year intervals. Well, the, night, the, the bad thing about that is, okay, what if my instance that I want to look at is three days ago between a two hour window? You can't do that with MRTG very easily. There's some of the newer pieces you can. Zavix out of the box you know, uh, is capable of doing that depending on how you do some of the data storage. Um, so uh, like Peter said, if we want to talk more and dive deeper into it and understand the software, we can come back and do another one very easily. Uh, so, next, let's, let's go ahead and start running this thing. Let's get this thing working. Let's see how it works. So on two screens, we're going to open up uh, onto our box the agent. This is the piece that will connect to my, soft, my hardware radio, and it will provide a network interface for all the other RTL software to connect with. So we connect to it, you know, it uh, you know, sets up a local host on port 123, good to go. Right here is where the client on the right side connects. So on the other side, I go and I run the RTL AMR program. It uh, sets the frequency to this, sets my, my sample rate, data rate, all the other pieces it needs to know, and bang, here's a piece of data. So we have type 5, uh, the ID of this. Now you'll notice that um, you know, the next screen is actually a little bit uh, easier to read. You'll notice that I've obfuscated the ID numbers. One of the interesting things in the license for RTL AMR is that the um, author states that if you were to uh, use the software that you must um, make an effort to protect the privacy of the users that, that you will see. So what's interesting to note, in a span of three, two, three, four, five different um, smart meters we're broadcasting to. Now you'll notice that some of them, that all of these were actually broadcasting the same consumption data. So 20, 21, 701, 20, that, that looks like a gas meter to me. Uh, this one, that looks like an electric meter, and yeah, that's probably an electric meter. Their usage, um, so whenever the counter increments kind of thing or, or on a regular basis, they'll just broadcast its usage. And so all they're doing is just going through and sniffing for that information, pulling it up. They have the association of your ID to your address, so now they know how to bill you. You're good to go. Um, it makes for some very interesting concepts that you might be able to do with this. Well, not necessarily smart hack your smart meter, but you can broadcast a separate signal yourself. Um, but I think that's where the CRC actually comes into play here. So the CRC is probably something to do with the serial number of the device and a few other things. So it, can provide a first layer of redundancy to ensure that you know it's not necessarily tampered. But it, it, if you guys know much about CRC, it's not foolproof. Uh, but it's a lot better than nothing. So, uh, 16-bit CRT is pretty trivial. Yep. So the uh, the next one. So now we've got to create a couple of service files. Um, you know, the biggest one is how are we going to run the RTL TCP you know um, component that we needed to run. So we have to create a service file um, because you know this is system D we're running on Fedora. So very straightforward actually. 
Um, we're going to make sure it always starts after the network target. Um, we're going to start the RTL TCP program with a statement. Now, I put this in here so that it basically starts on the public interface uh, and is publicly accessible on the Pi. So, if I don't have anything else connected to this uh, endpoint, I can connect from my desktop using the scanner software for RTL SDR, and I can now use it as a scanner from my Raspberry Pi. So it's pretty cool. Um, you know, we're going to restart this service always. We're going to put our time intervals that we're going to have for error rates and so forth, um, and so forth. So now uh, we need to also create another script uh, that will take the data from the RTL AMR program uh, that we saw earlier and actually use that out there and, and kind of pull it in. So, you know, we declare an array essentially. We, you know, this is all in Bash. We, you know, create an array of various components uh, that we're looking for. Um, I'll explain this here in a second. You know, then we run it into, into there and then we send it out. So, uh, I don't know how much you guys have done in, in Bash scripting, but the associative arrays were actually pretty, pretty awesome in that respect. So, we're going to take RTL, we're going to tell it to filter only for my two meters that I've got. And we're going to format the data in JSON. We're going to only get unique values. So if it's repeating itself, we're not going to see this. And then we're going to pipe it out into you know, uh, you know, the, a while loop. So we're going to read one line at a time. It's JSON coming out. And we're going to type it, pipe it into JQ, which is the command line JSON processor. We're going to pull out the message.id and the message.consumption information. Uh, we're now going to, um, using this out array, because we're creating two array elements from it. So the, the first element of our array is our message ID, which is our you know, ID that we've got here, and the amount of consumption. So our component that we're going to do, where we're looking at the, the first array, so the message ID will actually result in one of these two. Um, the, gas, the power consumption and gas consumption is something needed for Zabbix later. That's called the key inside of Zabbix. Um, so we basically pull it out there, very straightforward, and then we push it over to Zabbix as we get the data. So this is an interesting one. So if I'm getting updates multiple times a minute, I'm going to get it every time I get an update. So that's a very important detail for later. Um, now we create our service file to run this script uh, on startup. So we want to make sure we start after the RTL uh, TCP service. Uh, here's our script where we put it. Um, and we're, we're good to go. So once again, we, so we place all the, script, all the files into the Etsy system D system directory. Uh, we place our script where it needs to be. Uh, we tell system, control, system D to reload the daemons. Uh, and then we tell it to enable, and we reboot the machine. And upon reboot, it'll start pushing stuff up. However, we, we still have one last piece. We've got to put this all into Zabbix. So we have to create a host which Zabbix will associate with. Um, then that host has items associated with that, and the items are what we then graph. So, um, and then there's a couple of follow-on pieces. So the first one, we create our host. We're going to call this Pi Meter. I don't care necessarily about the what it is. Um, if we go back to here, we'll notice that we um, our Zabbix host is called Pi Meter, and we tell it what the host is. So when it connects to Zabbix, it says, "Hey, I have data for Pi Meter." And here's the key for the data that we want. So all those pieces have to kind of match up to each other uh, to fit for, for, for all the pieces. So we, we create it. We create a group, uh, Internet of Things devices. We also created some macros that we're going to leverage later, power factor. You know, like I say, I leveraged a power factor 0.85 because I'm AC uh, to convert this. And my voltage that I assumed was 120. If I had a voltmeter uh, or a power, fa power factor device, I'd get a lot better information but then I wouldn't be using over the air um, because I'd already have something wired in and I'd know what my power usage was right off the bat. So now we're going to create our power.consumption item. This is the one that's going to receive the data from our script. Um, it's a numeric float item. The units are in kilowatt hours. Um, and we're going to store, as the, as the data gets received by Zavix, we're going to store that resolution at 90 days. And then after, 300, after 90 days, we're going to get trend data, which is the min-max average over a one-hour period. Um, so that's kind of where I was talking about the granularity of Zabbix. Andrew, is that interface part of Zabbix? Yes, yes. This is the Zabbix UI. This is just the component as it relates to setting up an item. Um, and then 
Because the power in everything else is an integer number, and we're actually getting a fractional value, we have to do a multiplier to it. So we add a preprocessor to it that multiplies it by this, so we basically get our proper notation of our information. So you have to basically shift the decimal place on your, on your integer number that gets sent over the air. Uh, it's just part of the, the protocol, very straight. Now we stored that. Now we want to figure out, since I showed earlier, amperage. So we have to do a couple of interesting calculations. So power in kilowatts is equal to the energy in kilowatt hours over the time period. Well, my time period is one hour, or 3,600 seconds. But what I'm doing is I'm looking at the delta of my power consumption over a one minute interval. So I'm every minute, I'm looking at my interval of power and say, how many kilowatt hours have I used over a one minute period? But I have to fit, factor that out into a one hour interval because it's in kilowatt hours. So I have to multiply that by 60. Now I've got my power in kilowatts. Now because I'm going from kilowatts to amps is my next step, I now have to take, you know, multiply it by 1,000 times the, the power that we have in kilowatts over, you know, divide that by the power factor times the voltage, which is where we do here. So 1,000 times our you know, delta change over the last minute, converting it into kilowatts, and then we divide it by our power factor and our voltage, and then we assign that, and that is our units of amperage. And we store that in there so forth, resulting in the same thing we saw earlier. So the, the beauty of this one, it, like I say, is I have not made any physical changes to my house. I have not touched anything around here. I've also, the, the other graphs don't quite work as well, but I've also got one looking at uh, consumption of gas. Uh, that's in cubic feet uh, is how that comes across. And so I've kind of superimposed gas on top of um, the usage of uh, electricity, trying to see if I can correlate the two pits, but uh, because the interval uh, for my gas meter sending me any information is very small, or very large, sorry, um, it's very difficult for me to kind of graph that out and so forth. But a um, little work, I might be able to get that to, to, uh, to work better, um, but uh, overall it's a pretty straightforward and pretty easy process. Yes? I think when you were sniffing the data, how did you know which ID was yours? That was, the very, that was the tricky part. So if we go back to the beginning, um, so these photos, this was taken a long time apart. So the first was I actually had to go out and, and read my meter. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, that does help, but, you're, but when you've got a scrolling screen of numbers, seeing a jump of numbers, don't do that. So the, the, the best one was to go read your meter first. And that's going to get you a ballpark in there. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the pieces I blanked over were you know, the identifier to the meter and everything else. Unfortunately, they do not relate to the ID number that you actually get back here. So none of those ID numbers are actually on the outside of my meter. That was frustrating. Do they relate to the CCR? Hmm? Do they relate to the CCR? What do you mean? The um, CCR number at the end? Or not? Oh, the CRC? Yeah. Oh, that's the cyclic redundancy check. So that's basically um, probably your ID number plus your tamper values plus your consumption times a, um, a factor or a bit mask or something like that. And that'll give you your CRC. So um, that basically tells you that's a way of determining if this data is valid. So that's what the CRC is for. Yeah, you need the algorithm to use it. Yep. Um, but the CRC, uh, you know, once you know the algorithm exactly, can tell you, hey, is my data valid? Yep, or not, and, and so forth. Um, so yeah, you basically then have to read it and then start looking at these consumption numbers and go from here. Um, and, and so you look at your meter and then you came and looked at the data to figure out which one was closest. Pretty much. And then I kept looking a little closer and then I basically said, that looks right. I put it in the Zabbix and then all of a sudden the clothes dryer went on. I saw a huge spike. Yep, that really looks right, um, and so forth. Um, so it's definitely interesting how the service providers are more concerned about the integrity of the data than the availability of the data. Yeah. They easily do some nefarious things with this. Yes, technology. yes. Um, they and, care about charging them. In fact, there's some even more interesting things. I was talking to another person uh, who raised some other questions of, could you now use this to determine when someone's on vacation? Uh, and this would actually be a very good one. However, 
the challenge there becomes data collection. You now have to collect data over a period of time. You now have to case a facility which increases the potential for being caught, observed, seen, whatever. You know, maybe you'll throw a Raspberry Pi with a, you know, a so battery you somewhere. Raspberry Pi and put it somewhere in the tree. Yeah, so but, you know, but that <laughs> device might be discovered by a, snoot, by a dog sniffing around in the bushes, whatever. It takes time for that kind of an attack to work, but it's a very interesting one. Yeah, we don't, we don't know our neighbors. I mean, hell, criminals live in your neighborhood. Yeah. Everybody's neighborhood. So how many IDs were you getting? About 20. Yeah, see, that's, that's enough for a criminal to sit in his house and find out when you're on yeah. vacation. So, so, so what's your gut as far as distance to that place? About 50 feet. So, unfortunately, I can't see my water meter, which is at the front of the house, you know, so and so forth. Really? Um, so, either it's not in, in this band, it's a different band, or um, it's, you know, just the signal doesn't work because there's a bunch of brick between here and there. But at, uh, uh, what is that, Nine, 912 megahertz, I think it is? It should be able to go through brick. That's a, that's a pretty low frequency. What led you to do this? What prompted you to do this? So for a long time, I wanted to keep an eye on how much power am I drawing in the house so I can understand um, how, you know, where my limits are, because we have a, a generator on the house as well. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of know, well, what are my limits on power so that my generator will be able to handle this? Okay. Um, and you know, also to kind of keep track of, it, it's kind of a, you know, an interesting data point to see. Um, you know, there's 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 some value in just the the, the data you know, um, beyond that. So it's kind of you know from that perspective. But the thought of tearing you know into the panel breaker panel that's already loaded and adding this into an already loaded panel, not exactly that interested in you know doing, especially when you're in, inputting a low voltage kind of component into a high voltage circuit. Um, and mixing low voltage and high voltage and how do you do that, you know, change over properly within code is also challenging as well. So you found the SDR mm -hmm. and I'm sure it can do many other things. Oh yes, in fact, um, if you go to, if you use FlightAware, uh, FlightAware uses an RTL oh, SDR okay, yeah, yeah. Um, because the, uh, what is it, AVB or AVB or ATDB, I think is the signal type, planes essentially broadcast their location as they fly over. Yeah. And they just broadcast it below. And you can Anyone can receive it. And, and essentially the plane is saying, here's my altitude, here's my GPS coordinates. Good, done. Um, so FlightAware has had many people will set up an RTL, SDR radio in their house, and they'll basically pull the data and broadcast it up into FlightAware so it becomes part of that FlightAware cloud. Um, you can even do that on your home and see, okay, which planes have flown over. Uh, and so forth. So it's it's very interesting in that regard uh, and very easy. Um, you can a lot of people will use it. I can see in a second. Uh, a lot of people will use it also to pull NOAA satellite data. So the geo satellites broadcast their their image uh, on a regular basis and you know, set up a right antenna. And people will uh, basically post up the photos that they're getting of the satellite images that are coming down from the geos because they're unencrypted in the clear. Anyone can receive them, you just have to know the, what the format is. You had a question? Yeah, um, the graph you had, mm -hmm. what's the gray areas? So that's a function of Zabbix. Um, is that like showing an average, that's where the average is? No, goes? so this is, uh, this is set up right now for uh, what, what they call work days. So the white is called work hours, and that's off work hours, because you know, it's, it's centered you know, towards the enterprise. Okay. So you know, basically I've told it, hey, that's a weekend. So you'll see weekends like that. And then overnights like this, um, okay. most customers don't bother because it's set for like eight till eight p.m. or something like that, eight to seven or eight to six, um, and so forth. You know, it kind of also nicely tells you when a day was. You know, here's the seventh. You know, yeah. um, so you know, there's there's the middle of the seventh up. There's the midnight for eight. So it kind of it was significant to the date, which is not. Yeah, it's significant to the date. Okay. So it gives you, you. Know, that one. Yes. Not yet. I've only got about half a month's worth of data so far, about a half a month to a month. Um, and so I haven't you know, necessarily compared it against there. Um, but I would expect my raw uh, power consumption one to be correct. Unfortunately, that was a graph I should have put in. If you look at the raw consumption graph, you'll just see a horizontal line going up into the right uh, with a little bit of wave and so forth. And that's where the deltas start to make it a little easier to see the data. So, any questions?
Wonderful. Thank you. Susie, do you want to come up and talk a little bit? She's talking. Susie? She's working. She's working. Yeah, you got a plus. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm in the Ducey, okay. I just wanted to came here to uh, introduce myself. Uh, welcome. Welcome to. Uh. Well, my name is in the Ducey, okay. I've been in the IT Learning System Administration uh, field for the past uh, eight years, along with uh, three years, actually three and a half years, of being uh, quality control and insurance uh, pers personnel and IT asset manager. I mean, IT asset uh, manager for uh, uh, for the uh, federal government. Actually, as a contractor, a federal contractor known as Evolve for Inc. I have eight years of uh, IT experience. I, I eight years of IT experience, and I did burn my uh, archive box over there, which runs on Lubuntu. Well, that that's it. Okay. Welcome, welcome, to welcome. Thank welcome. You. Here, have a have a red tag. <laughs> <laughs> so, Susie, do you want to come up and talk a little bit about what you're looking for right now? What kind of jobs and, and all that stuff is going on? Uh, me. No, anyone, Susie. for anyone. Susie. Well, I'm actually looking for a job. Right well, that's now. what Susie is here for. She's a yeah. recruiter. Susie's a recruiter. Come on up. You don't have a presentation, huh? No, I don't, no, no. I, I wish I did, but I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, SGT Recruiting is an agency that's been, has been supporting Red Hat. Yeah, all the food and coffee is due to Susie. <laughs> so remember to thank her very much. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in addition to Red Hat's public sector team, I also support a couple of other uh, regional and national organizations that are hiring in the skill sets, in the similar skill sets, systems engineers, automation engineers, and middleware engineers. So, it's the whole game of the skill sets. So, I, I come to these events not only so I can learn a little bit more about the industry and the candidates that I'm going to be talking to. Again, I always heard the term open source, but I actually... I was wrong in how I thought about it <laughs> until today, so thanks, Peter. Um, so uh, these meetups allow me to have a little bit of an understanding. So uh, in, in terms of new technology, um, in terms of how they're applied, um, and trends that, that, uh, in terms of how they're being used. So uh, in terms of from a recruiting perspective, uh, it's, it's twofold. Um, I actually get a chance to understand how, you, how you're using the tools. Um, and learn a little bit more about um, uh, what it is that you may be looking for if you approach me at the end. You know, at the end, I'm happy to also review resumes, uh, give guidance in terms of job seekers and, and job seeking activities. It's not just uh, a one-way street. From most recruiters, will say the same things. Our goal is always not only to sort of again recruit because that's our job, but also to give back to help you in any way that you can. Even if I don't have a current opportunity for you that aligns with your skill sets. Perhaps I have a, um, a colleague or a network of colleagues that can take advantage of your skill sets somewhere else. So it's not just me, you know, hoping to take advantage of the situation, but in some way giving back as well. So when a candidate comes to you for one of these jobs, what are you looking for? What are the things that to you highlight? Uh, well, okay, so I, from, the, from this particular event, most people that I'm looking for here are people who are command line gurus. Um, and uh, you know, this is you know some of the, what I learned from Andrew. I'm, I'm not even 100 percent sure what the command line means, but I know there's a script somewhere that you put into it, and it makes the machine go. So, uh, right. <laughs> so, um, so I know the difference between people who can develop using the UI, which is not a skill set that I desire, but the people who are actually scripting from scratch. That is the differentiator. So I've learned enough from my hiring managers um, and from coming to these events, what differentiates a good 
um, administrator from a, or systems engineer from a grade one. So I, I'm learning to ask the questions that go maybe just a little bit below the, hey, do you work on the command line? They're like, yeah, I'm on the command line all the time. I'm like, okay, what have you done? And if they say, oh, <laughs> what languages have you used? Or like, there is no language I don't develop. So I'm like, it helps me differentiate. So what I'm looking for from this audience are the command line gurus who really know in almost any language from PowerShell, which I'm, again, licensed product, PowerShell, Bash, Shell, um, Python. So what about that Ansible? Well, Ansible is, um, it's, it's, that's a tool, an automation tool. <laughs> so, right, I know there's a tower. <laughs> it's a new tower. Uh, so it does the tool for you. So it's like, uh, it's Red Hat's version of an automation tool, but I'm not sure what it's developed in, what language it's developed in. Is it Python? Python. Python. Yeah, Python. Okay, so it does the tool for, so instead of creating from scratch, I'm using a tool to do the automation But it's basically replacing Bash. But yes. It's so it is a language. language. Right. Yeah. What is the language? Okay, so, but that's, okay, so people who use the tools and they have to under, the understanding behind how those tools work, that would be a second layer question. So there are similar tools to Ansible that I would look for as well, but they're all written in languages and have them understanding what those languages are and how they use them would be an asset. Hello, what? Hello, okay. Who what cares about, about Perl? I, <laughs> I have never had clients ask me for Perl. Oh, really? That's yep. See, you come in and learn something too about right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a Python, uh, Python uh, Bash shell, PowerShell, in terms of the on the line, besides Ansible products. So, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, I wouldn't forget that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> if, if you are in the market or you just think about looking for a job, Get Susie's contact information. She can certainly guide you to say where do you want to look and where do you want to go based on where you are right now. She may have some questions about what you're doing or what you're looking for, but anyone that can sort of get you introduced, uh, speaking for myself, just coming to these meetings is how I got my current job. And, and her website is sg2recruiting.com. Right, right. And I'm happy to help, like I said, for those people who are look, thinking about or haven't looked for a job in a while. There's so many tools out there. I know we, we talked about this Ridgeline and their recruiter when we were up here like not too long ago. Um, how you marry your paper resume to your online presence and how you improve the likelihood that you're found by recruiters um, through social media. So all of the, all of the, I'm sure all the tools I'm using now do a lot of what you're doing behind the scenes, which is aggregating all your social media activity and putting it in front of me and how you improve your, uh, the likelihood of you being found using those social media tools, attending meetups, posting pictures from you being at a meetup, responding to a question, asking a question at a meetup, all of a sudden all of your social media numbers go up, even without having to use any other activities. So I'm happy to help. And Magna, if you do get in touch with her, be sure to mention that you met her here. <laughs> you gotta give her a reason for coming. I'll definitely be back. I enjoy this. This has been a great group, by the way. And did you want to? Um, I'm with Ridgeline. Um, you know the Ridgeline International. The main reason why we got involved with Nova Lug is because I happened to go to Nova Lug, and you guys said you wanted a space that supported more people. Um, and so our company uses a lot of open source technologies, and they just wanted to give back to the community. So do you make cars? I mean, appreciate it. Huh? Do you make cars? No, we do not make cars. <laughs> it's, not, I have no, I, I mean, it's just a name to me. What is it? <laughs> Ridgeline International, we're a boutique IT company. Okay. Um, we are, I think, what is it, the, the catchphrase is, is we're in the top 50 companies in the DC metro area as far as growth. Um, they'll say that they have around 200 employees. In actuality, you'll interact with probably about 30 employees in the office on a, on a daily basis. So. It's a really small boutique company. We offer insane benefits. Um, an example is like, I get a clothing allowance. I've never had a company buy my clothes, and maybe I don't show that today. <laughs> but you fit but, in. So. But yeah. Yeah. if I want a new shirt, I can go buy a new shirt, and the company pays for it, and, it, and, it, and it's great. So um, you know, we offer really unique things. So. The type of people that we're looking for are, you know, we're looking for developers, people that can write code. We have a whole group that we're 
really kicking off from the ground. We probably have about four or five developers, and we're looking for people that know Java, Python, JavaScript. Um, we're looking for people that are familiar with containers. Um, we're looking for Linux engineers, people that know Cisco's um, networking routes, VLANs, um, uh, everything on Linux, Docker, Kubernetes, Swarm. Um, we're really kind of a nimble company, so we're not focused on one thing. We'll use whatever gets the job done. Um, the other thing is, is that our domain name is ridgelineintl.com, and on that page we have a place where you can submit resumes, and if you come talk to me, I'm going to say go submit your resume there. If you know anybody that's looking, please tell them to go to that again. It's ridgelineintl.com. We actually just hired our HR person for doing recruiting, and so she's actively reaching out to people. Um, and also, I believe both Susie and Ridgeline are in the sponsors on Meetup. Yeah. Um, so, because Ridgeline, Ridgeline pays for our space, and it is not cheap. They, uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they are giving a lot of money for us to be able to keep going because we grew out of the Red, Red Hat conference room space. Um, basically, had we still been there, you guys would be here, you guys wouldn't, <laughs> based on space. But, and so we, we grew out of that, and Ridgeline thankfully stepped up and offered to pay for the space, and for that we are forever grateful. So, and as, as you alluded to, this is our last time in, in the Sheridan. We will be at the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm going to update the meetup page tonight um, to give people plenty of opportunity, which we'll have a map and tell you where it is. It's, still in, the, it's in the Tyson's area. It's it, off of West Park Drive. And, and just so everybody's aware, I said this once before, you'll go to the parking garage, you'll grab a ticket, you're not paying for anything, you'll go into the office of the Chamber of Commerce, they have a card validator, you'll validate the card in the office, parking is free for all the people that go to the event, and it, it is a very nice space. So, um, as always, our goal is to keep this totally free. Yeah, for, are we recording right now? Oh, it's not anymore. Not anymore.